the shadow of Bourneville in a Birmingham back street lies the lair of a lady who has devilish designs on chocolate. Hello. Welcome to Conjurer's Kitchen. Come on in. Annabelle de Vetten has a peculiar flair for ghoulish gattos and deadly desserts. Death by chocolate, anyone? I think the weirdest thing that I've ever made was a full-size decomposing body in a shallow grave. She was adorned with chocolate maggots, and the maggots looked so real as well. Mmm, delicious. When people eat my chocolate creations, there's a moment where the brain and the eyes kind of have a bit of a battle because you're looking at these bones and flesh and intestines. And after the first bite, they're like, oh my God, this is really nice. And then there's no stopping them. This gruesome gourmet has created a veritable mortuary of tasty morsels. But now Annabelle has finally found the perfect client. My latest commission is um, Angel of Death winged skull, which is just completely chocolate, for a, a first birthday party. Not exactly your average first birthday party. An alternative local undertakers is celebrating a year in business and wants Annabelle to mark the occasion with one of her chocolate creations. My intentions for this one is um, make a solid chocolate skull without the jaw so I can sculpt some teeth missing and make it look really old. I want her to look quite feminine, quite regal. And apart from the solid chocolate skull, everything is going to be made from uh, a soft, sculptable chocolate, which is really creamy and really delicious. But this time, Annabelle's really got her work cut out. She has two days to design and deliver her finished masterpiece. This is going to be a tough build. We have seven kilos of white chocolate, which is obviously quite a lot for 20 people. So when you see me again, I have big black circles under my eyes, so you'll know why. We'll see how her scary sculpture shapes up later. This chocolate artist has been given an unusual commission. She's creating a macabre chocolate sculpture for a local undertaker's birthday party. In Annabelle's house of chocolate horrors, it's day one, making the angel of death. Today I'm making the chocolate skull for the angel of death sculpture. So now it has nicely melted, it's a nicely, nice consistency. Very happy with this, and now I'm gonna pour it into here. I'll start slushing it around to get the chocolate to go into the eye sockets and into the nose and under the jaw. What I'm gonna do next is put this in the fridge, leave it to chill for a few hours, keep my fingers crossed uh, until I pull it out and unmold it. So, hop, hop. But there's no rest for the wicked in Annabelle's eerie abode. Her skull needs some wings. This is an armature, so this is just regular copper piping. So the skull is going to go on there. What I'm doing now is I'm going to determine the shape of the wing. And then once it's all laid out properly, then I will cover it in foil and make it food safe. Now I'm going to take the skull out of the fridge. Okay, this is it. <gasps> Make or break, literally. Yay! It's lovely. So we have a skull, very happy with it. Now it's all about giving her some wings, like a good angel should have. One day to go. Annabelle is racing to complete her chocolate challenge. Tonight, she must make each individual feather for the wings out of special homemade modeling chocolate. Each one of these is pretty intricate. Each one is completely hand-crafted. 
Um, there's probably going to be about 20 on each wing and then some around the front. I've got my little pizza wheel and I'm just cutting them to get this sort of movement and to make them look a bit more organic. There's a lot of work to do. I think I'm going to be up all night, but you know, we get along. We have uh, things to talk about, don't we? The end is nigh. Artist Annabelle de Vetten has been burning the midnight oil to finish her chocolate angel of death for an unusual funeral parlor party. Hello, come on in. She has cast a human skull and white chocolate and given it a pair of wings before adorning them with intricate handcrafted feathers. You ready? Okay, here she is. Are you happy? Yes, yes, I am. <gasps> Excellent, she's happy. She's done it. The chocolate angel of death is complete. And now her chariot awaits. Or rather, an electric eco hearse sent by the undertakers. But will it fit? Just fit through there. Just hope the journey goes safely now. Yeah, if you just go straight across. Ah! Oh, gosh, moving. Ah! See, this is where the damage will occur now. <laughs> it's like it's arrived safely. As the angel of death takes her place, party guests are beginning to arrive. All that's left to do is I'm just going to drape her briefly to give that big reveal. Just going to wait for a few more people to come. She's all draped. I've done all I can. Now it's crunch time. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you all for coming. Annabelle is a brilliant artist, and she's made us something really special for today's party. So follow us in. <laughs> Let's go. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my God! <laughs> you like it? <laughs> That's a chocolate. Yeah, it's <laughs> Oh, it's absolutely beautiful. It's perfect. The funeral parlour party goers have spoken. Now time to tuck into the angel of death. I had genuinely no idea how detailed it was going to be, all those little feathers and the skull. The skull's astonishing, you know, just beautiful. It looked like marble. It looked like a statue. And now we've eaten it. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. In the world of chocolate making, eccentric chocolatiers are everywhere. Great! It's a real cumber bunny. Artists brimming with crazy ideas. It's a good taste too. Ready to spring their creations on the world. This time we're in Tewkesbury, Gloucestershire. Home to one woman, Willy Wonka, Prudent State. Not like that. This is Apollo, the god of light. And that was a bit challenging because it was quite warm, but he didn't melt. I always wanted to become a food artist. I did my first sculpture when I was six years old when I made a penguin out of a pear. And I always knew I was going to be different <laughs> and slightly barking. Solid chocolate portraits where you can eat the whole thing. This is entirely edible, about two kilos of chocolate. And the idea is that you can eat your own face. Based at this idyllic farm, Prudence has been making weird and wonderful chocolate for over 20 years. And it looks just like a martini. <laughs> she has created a chocolate shoe shop for Cadbury, a life-size Molly Malone, and even a working chocolate pub. 
you could have a chocolate glass, go up to the beer tap, pour yourself some beer, drink it and then eat the glass. Her latest client is local boy Jack. He's come with an unusual birthday request. So uh, I had an idea of a Shakespeare bust for my girlfriend, Samantha, who's a Shakespeare actress. I'll leave it up to you, mm. to your artistic license. You're happy license. for me just yeah, to sort of just... make up something, but basically I'll just sort of sculpt it yeah. and uh, see how we get on. I trust your judgment. I look forward to seeing it. Thank Brilliant. You. Yeah. Thanks. I'm not really sure what Prudence is going to come up with, but um, I do trust her and uh, she's got a very creative imagination, so um, I really look forward to seeing what she comes up with. Prue already has a lot on her plate, but that's not enough for this eccentric chocolatier. Having built a reputation for throwing in extras, she has a surprise up her sleeve. A concept she's experimented with, but never carried out for a paying customer. Until now. I'm going to make a chocolate record that actually plays music, because if it works on this, which is like chocolate, technically it should work on chocolate. And so you can dance to it, hear it, and then eat it. Musical chocolate? What could possibly go wrong? So whether the needle breaks or stylus breaks, you know, does the chocolate just get grated as it goes around? Or it's so scratched that it's just... just noise. To get the record right is essential. This has got to work, otherwise I'm going to look like a right idiot. <laughs> the chocolatier making a living from incredible bespoke creations, like chocolate artist Prudence State. She's currently attempting to turn 30 slabs of milk chocolate into the head of William Shakespeare. Shakespeare has been quite tricky. It's not like there's a definite answer to what he looks like, but this has already been through quite a few facelifts, so to speak. What does his hair look like? Normally, you see him with that sort of bold head with a sort of font, you know, here that's all a bit sort of rah. So I'm going to do a bit of that. And then if that doesn't look right, I can then carve it off and sculpt it. This is definitely going to be a lot of late nights to get this done in time. But like I said, I work better under pressure, so I just hope that I don't crack, or he does. <laughs> Assuming Prue and Will do remain intact, Prudence has an extra surprise for the client a chocolate record. She's already commissioned a mould and is itching to get started. We all know records can be pressed onto vinyl, but can the same be done with chocolate? What I'm actually doing now is melting some dark chocolate. The theory is that the dark chocolate should hold the grooves stronger and harder than, say, milk chocolate, because it's got more cocoa solids in it. And with a 53% cocoa content, she's hoping dark chocolate will produce the sweetest music. I think we're nearly there. So this is at 34.5 degrees C, which is perfect. I've got a vibrating table here, so this should help with the air bubbles. So I'm just going to turn it on. It's a little bit noisy. It's essential that I get this in the fridge now so it can chill in time. So I'm just going to pop it in the fridge for about 20 minutes. The chocolate is set, so I'm going to have a go at unmoulding it and hopefully the grooves have taken into the chocolate. Now, I've got no idea what's underneath here. It could just be air bubbles and nightmares. OK, I'm going to gently take it off. Oh, it's shiny. So it looks pretty good. The thing with vinyl is it's a hard plastic, so it's designed to pick up sound, but I'm working with chocolate, which is very different. I'm going to check if the grooves are OK with this microscope. It's really groovy! It's groovy, but it isn't perfect. There's a few air bubbles. <laughs> I think the next thing we need to do is get a hole drilled through this and get it on a player and see what we get. But despite all the advances in modern chocolate technology, there's still really only one way to put a hole in a record. So this is it. This is the moment of truth. Will it break or will it be fine? Here we go. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. It's perfect. Look at that. We've got grooves, we've got a hole, but will it play? 
We'll be back to find out later. In Tewkesbury, it's the final push for Prudence. 80 hours of chocolate mastery have come to a head. A life-size head of William Shakespeare, commissioned for a birthday party. It's the suffocation of William Shakespeare. Something I'm sure every GCSE English student would love to do. Oh, God. Ah! <laughs> but Prudence has also been working on an extra special surprise for the birthday girl. Here is the final chocolate record. No idea whether it works or not. I suppose we'll find out later. With the bard safely packed and secured into the van, Prudence begins the one-hour journey to a very special venue. Well, that's it. To be or not to be, we'll find out. In Shakespeare's hometown. You almost like want to have, like, fragile bard on board. Stratford-upon-Avon is world-famous for being Shakespeare's birthplace. And today, the bard is going back to school because this Tudor building contains the great man's former classroom. And it's also where a surprise birthday party for a Shakespeare fan will take place. There you go. Just keep him flat. Right, you, you go in first. If Will can make it there in one piece. I've unwrapped all the components, the decorative bits. As well as making a chocolate bard, Prue's produced accessories including a skull, dagger and candles, all of them completely edible. And there's the scary bit where I've actually got to get Shakespeare on here. So me and Becky are just going to start unwrapping him now. Weighing in at a whopping 15 kilos, Bill is made of 75% Belgian milk chocolate and 25% dark. Well, he's intact for the minute unless he just spontaneously collapses. Now he's at home, he might just go, well, yeah, I can chill out now. Guests have arrived, it's all on, and what they don't know yet is the little secret of the record. I hope this doesn't break the birthday. Right on cue, birthday girl Samantha arrives. Prue's hard work has paid off as Samantha is bowled over by her birthday bard. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it's got the bard bird on it! <laughs> That's amazing, thank you so much. <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. The whole thing is completely edible. It's a shame to eat it, it's just so lovely. The bust has gone down a treat, but it's now time for Prudence to reveal her musical chocolate surprise. Can I have everyone's attention, please? I have a little surprise for you. <laughs> Another one. Another surprise. <laughs> oh, my God. Look at that. Is that made out of chocolate as well? Is it, that's going to work? We'll be back to find out. <laughs> okay. See whether this dark chocolate record will actually play. <laughs> So would you like to try it? Would you like to eat yeah. your chocolate record? Should we break a record together? It. You should be able to just nibble the edges. Of it. <laughs> Let's go for it. Oh. Teeth still intact? Just about. Wow. Good though. That's nice. Mm. That is very good. <laughs> and this plays music. I can't believe you can eat that. <laughs> it was just fantastic. I mean. A 15 kilo chocolate Shakespeare and then um, a chocolate record with my name on it. That's just so cool. That record played that clearly. You know, it's pin sharp, but it's in chocolate. It's still bonkers that that works. That, how is that possible? Shall we eat the bard? <sighs> Maybe. I'm, I want to save it for as long as possible. It's, it's too special to smash up. You don't get something like that very often. Cool. Thank you. First things first, making some rather tasty cement for her replica boarding school. Okay, so there's my hot cream. 
I'm making some chocolate ganache. I need loads of this, and I'm not going to mix it, not going to touch it, because chocolate doesn't like to be mixed. It's very hot now. I'm going to wait till it cools, then I'm going to mix it. Patience. Once it's cooled, Rosie can attack the ganache with gusto. I am like a human cement mixer at the moment. I'm only more tired. <laughs> I've only got about seven of these to do. You'd think I'd be fitter, really, wouldn't you? Rosie will need to hand mix a total of 10 kilos of this chocolate cement. Then she must plaster it all over each of the school's five chocolate towers. It's an ambitious job, but then Rosie has always been something of a high flyer. Well, I studied as an architect, became a pilot in the army. In fact, Rosie was the army's very first female helicopter pilot. And then became a cake maker. I have no way of linking the three together, but here I am with chocolate. There are loads of pressures that came with flying. And there are still pressures now, they're just different. And certainly my biggest pressure, especially with this cake, is time. Lest we forget, this is one of five parts of the building. <laughs> we'll be back later to see if Rosie can manage to turn this into a chocolate replica of this. Maybe I should have picked a smaller school. <laughs> In Lancashire, Rosie Dummer has been hard at work recreating a boarding school in chocolate. She's made five chocolatey building blocks, covered them in ganache, and is ready to add the final top layer. Modelling chocolate makes all the difference in the world. I'm giving myself nicer flavours, I think, but also smoother finishes. That's it. One batch done. About 10 more to go. I think that's an under-exaggeration. I think it's going to be more than that. To make her chocolate school picture perfect, Rosie needs to replicate every detail, right down to the brickwork. Well, I've got a silicon impress mat, and the plan is that I create a little bit of a texture that I can then paint up and make it look like brickwork. So this is... The moment of true. Okay, and it looks great. That is what I was after. View, what a relief. That's right. Bricky, that's what I am. So that's good. I'm happy, and that means that I can now work out how to do the windows. This is the bit I like, getting to the detail. It's a good job she likes the detail, as there are 38 windows to make, so we leave her to it. And return six days later to find her... doing the windows? It's driving me nuts, so I'm doing them in stages. So I've got, so far, they're finished, these aren't. <sighs> and I'm plodding on. But to give Rosie her dues, as well as the 38 windows, she's constructed all five towers, imprinted thousands of bricks and made a start on the columns. It's a lot to do. But at least there is one job she'll be getting some help with. I genuinely think this is brilliant. All of the children at the college have been asked if they want to make themselves. So they are making figures of themselves out of chocolate and icing. I've done these little prototypes with little tutorials. So there's my little schoolboy. I've got my little schoolgirl. They're going to have their own little school photo of their edible figures outside the front of the college. I have to be done by tomorrow, but I've got, I've got to do these by tonight because they need to set and dry and I've got to colour them. So, gosh, I didn't thought of that colouring. That's right. Not only does Rosie still have to finish the building work, she also has the laborious task of painting the whole chocolate school. It's going to be the longest night, as in I'm not going to sleep at all. And I know that now. I already know that, but... There you go. Go big or go home. Yeah. 
Lancashire's prestigious Stonyhurst College counts three saints, a Bolivian president, and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle amongst its alumni, and today is celebrating its 425th anniversary. To mark this event, it's being rebuilt block by block in chalk. But with only a few hours to go, Rosie Dummer's far from finished. Although she does have some good news. I finished the windows. I finished the windows at about one o'clock in the morning. That was a big moment for me. Now I've got all the painting to do. I'm panicking because it isn't enough time to do it justice. And with literally hours till the big event, Rosie has had to draft in recruits. I love my son but I've never loved him as much as I love him this much moment in time. Turned up at just the right minute, doing me grass. Now I want him to lay me drive. While son Oscar lays the drive, Rosie carries out some finishing touches, replicating the school's golden-coloured stonework. I think I've done enough to get it over there. Everything else is going to have to be done there, but at the moment, school time. Time marching on, Rosie calls in the cavalry to transport a chocolate school to the bricks and mortar version. This is the bit where I call in every favour. So neighbours, friends, anyone who's got a bit of muscle has been called in because I am terribly concerned that this is going to uh, challenge them. Challenge them, let's see. That's right. With a 100 kilo, six foot long chocolate school to transport, will Rosie's creation collapse like a house of cards? Or will it be a piece of cake? Is it bending? Um, okay. That's it. I'm happy now. <laughs> school safely in the van, Rosie drives on ahead to greet them at the other end as they drive very, very carefully. Is that a really long drive, or is he driving really slowly? Having survived the 20-minute journey intact, it's time to get Chocolate Stonyhurst into the real thing. I'm just going to get this started. I'm leaving it to... I'm trusting my husband with my cake. That's how much I trust him. I haven't been divorced before. This could be interesting. But Rosie's fears are unfounded. Her chocolate creation is in safe hands. Sort of. John, if you, would you reckon you'd be OK on one end? Ready? Hauling this colossal confection into place requires regular rest stops. Where's the next chance to rest the cake? So there are strategically placed tables at every turn. Another table through there. But a centuries-old building has its drawbacks. No lifts. Go all the way around, Jordan. Oh, okay. So the cake's going up sideways that way. No, no, sorry, sorry. One final push sees the chocolate school upstairs, ready to be revealed to the children. Rosie's creation contains 10 kilos of chocolate ganache, 65 kilos of modelling chocolate and fondant, and will be adorned with 86 chocolatey children, with varying amounts of limbs. But will the kids give it top marks? Do you like it? With the final towers added, Rosie's creation is a showstopper and a perfect replica of this imposing school. Now there's only one thing left to do. Happy 425th birthday! This is your cake! Beautiful, but it's so sad to eat it. I love chocolate. <laughs> and have a brick of stony hearts. This is what it tastes like, really chocolatey and vintage. <laughs> I'm really trying hard to hide it, but I'm so ecstatic. I don't think I've ever seen a cake that big. At the end of the day, I'm really happy with what I ended up with. Our college motto is as much as we can, so uh, they'll probably demolish it in seconds, I'm sure. Well, for now, Stonyhurst, bon appetit.
Chocolate comes in many shapes and forms, but for chocolatier Paul Wayne Gregory, creating a chocolate spectacle is his stock in trade. The reaction that I want from my clients and from the general public when they see my chocolate is, wow, that's not chocolate, or how did you make that from chocolate? For myself, I have to bring an element to the display or to the chocolates that's never been done. From under a railway arch in South London, Paul creates everything from larger-than-life chocolate men to chocolate horses, and even entirely edible chocolate dresses. The best dress we made was when I teamed up with the designer from Downton Abbey. That was able to be worn on a catwalk at least two or three times. So that was fantastic. Really, really good. For his latest chocolate fancy, he's come to a prestigious London hotel. Paul plans to launch a new line of rum truffles here, accompanied by a show-stopping chocolate sculpture. Why I'm here today is because I want to uh, cast a barman's hands. I've got this crazy idea to build this display, which is more like an illusion. Paul intends to use chocolate to sculpt a pair of barman's arms pouring rum. But that's not all. He wants the rum to continually pour into a glass without ever overflowing. The first thing he will need to create his magical chocolate barman is a barman. Thank you for being the model for today. I'm building a chocolate display and your arms are going to be made out of chocolate. I want to create something that looks really realistic, so that's why I need to mould hands. Chocolatier Paul applies a skin of silicone to the arm holding the glass. This will eventually solidify to create his chocolate mould. Next, he repeats the process on the barman's pouring arm, capturing a lifelike rum-pouring pose. Finally, he adds a layer of plaster of Paris and cling film. With everything set, Paul's chocolate moulds can finally be removed, ready for use. At the moment, it just looks like a mess. The moment of truth is obviously when we mould from it, but so far, by looking at it, yeah, I'm happy, very happy. Bermondsey Backstreet, chocolatier Paul Wayne Gregory is hard at work. He's creating a chocolate sculpture of a pair of barman's arms, pouring a bottle of rum. The idea is the rum keeps pouring and the glass never overflows, thanks to hidden pipework. But with time running out, Paul has only just started moulding the chocolate arms. When I mould them, what I'm hoping for is that I've got the right thickness, uh, there's no breakages, and I've got a beautiful looking forearm. So I can then put it together with the fingers and start the real work. These forearms will also hide inner pipework, supplying the everlasting rum. That's why it's got to be hollow. Otherwise, I won't be able to put the working parts inside. It's like building two jobs, because you've got the inner works and then you've got the chocolate. If it was just a display, oh yeah, no, no problem. But getting it to work at the same time, woo! To support the arms, Paul has created an elaborate chocolate pedestal. This will hold more hidden pipes to recycle the rum and create a magical, everlasting pour. So this one here is part of the illusion. This pipe's going to feed through it. And when that falls in there, take off the, the mould around the outside, put it inside, fill it with chocolate, and it will look exactly like the others. So by the time I finish, you won't see any of the underneath working parts. Hmm, sounds simple, but Paul will make sure with a quick test. What I'm going to do now is just test if it's leaking. So this is the part that goes into the bottle. This is the part that connects to my glass. So will it or will it not work? <laughs> Drum roll. <laughs> there should be water coming out of here. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Bob's your uncle, fan is your aunt. Hey! Very happy. Ta da! <laughs> it still can go wrong because um, I've still got to feed these tubes through the arms and feed them through the plinth. A little bit of chocolate gets stuck inside, we're in trouble. Illusion working, 
Paul next removes the forearms from their mould. At the moment, to the untrained eye, it just looks like a, a mess. <laughs> but trust me, that's going to work. Because why? I've got the channel in the, second, in the centre. There I can lay my um, internal workings and the rest of it I can build. Paul will fuse these arms with chocolate hands once he gets them out of the mould. Now for the big one, for the fingers. Let's see how they came out. Very tricky. The dark chocolate fingers are well and truly stuck. I know at this stage I'm not, I'm not going to be able to get the mould over the fingers and I'm, the mould's starting to rip, so it's better for me to break the fingers. With the unveiling just over 24 hours away, Paul will have his work cut out, putting his barman together again. To get all this done in that amount of time, I am worried, because this is the first time I've actually created an illusion with chocolate. But I'm the chocolate magician, so I'll be fine. As if by magic, 12 hours later, the chocolate barman is fixed. Well, nearly. So the main problem that I had and will continue to have is the broken fingers. So I'm like Dr Chocolate, fixing fingers. The next challenge is for these fragile fingers and arms to support a rum bottle and glass. My concerns uh, is weight distribution. Um, that's my biggest problem. Now, holding this arm like this is quite heavy. And get that weight distribution on this pillar, very, very difficult. To finish the job, Paul must keep fixing delicate fingers. And add plenty of chocolatey support. Before the final touch, a glistening chocolate spray. So that's it, now we're finished. Um, I'm happy with that. So now I've just got to pack up and get it there. So to the chocmobile. Do you mind holding this? <laughs> Many hands make light work, and Paul's going to need all the support he can get to keep his creation from collapsing. It may not work, but it looks absolutely amazing. The chocolate arms are finally in position. Paul can now move on to creating his perpetual glass-filling illusion. So, where's that glass? So the original glass broke in the back of the van when everything fell over. It's not just a glass he needs. A hole has to be made. Just don't try this at home. Chocolatiers, we're woodworkers, we're glass workers, we're metal workers, we can work with anything. Very delicate, very, very delicate, it can take time. So job done, we're ready to go. Right, I just can put the bottle on now. Let's hope the chocolate barman doesn't drop it. The glass is becoming a nightmare. Fingers crossed or fingers broken, it's actually it. <laughs> As the guests arrive for the event, it's time for some rum. I think we've done as much as we can do. It worked earlier, so fingers crossed. It works with the alcohol. Okay. Take this off. Someone's blocked now. Someone's blocked. With the pipe blocked, there's only one thing for it, a good old fashioned suck. That's some nice rum. <laughs> <laughs> That's some nice rum. So finally got it working. It, it took us to hell and back, but it's done. Paul's barman extravaganza is complete. Hidden beneath astonishingly lifelike chocolate arms, rum runs into a glass forever. Workings cunningly covered by a facade of chocolate and creating the illusion of an everlasting Paul that Paul was looking for. So will people like it? Thank you very much. The sculpture is absolutely amazing. It's a real work of art. I was mesmerised, but I'm still trying to find out, actually, how, how this magic works. Everyone understood the theme of it. They understood the, 
why it was here. They understood uh, the method. They don't understand how it was done, which is great. <laughs>
and Claude Monet's famous water lilies have been recreated in coloured cocoa butter. Now Gabriella has come up with an ingenious way to create some delicate chocolate lily pads. OK, we did it. So all we're going to do is we're going to dip the balloon into the chocolate, bring it up, and then quickly turn it over. Give it a quick tap to just even out this little bit here. You can see we're going to get a really, really, really nice thin edge, which makes it really elegant. Once they are set, she carefully peels off the chocolate and sprays it lily pad green. Now it's time to create the insects that land on them. Gabriella has hand-drawn butterflies and now carefully pipes the chocolate over the design. Then lets them cool and set. Yeah, really, really happy with these. They're really nice and delicate and they'll make a really nice addition and bring the sculpture to life. It's the final day, and Gabriella has to bring all the fragile elements together. But the room is overheating. Her chocolate dream could melt before her very eyes. Yeah, no, it's quite warm still. Well, I can bring the fan up from the kitchen. Let's bring the fan up, we'll open the windows, and I will speak to facilities again it's to really... see if we can get the temperature sorted. It's really hot. OK. Back downstairs, Gabriella needs everyone to keep their cool, literally. All the flowers in, this, in the main sculpture um, we will carry by hand, yeah. going to have to. Yeah, yeah, but we need J-cloths, because um, hands, yeah. and we'll stick them in ice water before we, before we move anything. All right. All right. There's not much time left. The event is only hours away. OK, cool. Finishing touches. It's ready to move into its final position for the party. Oh my god. Watch the top. Perfect. Okay, ready? Yep. Up. Okay, and again, if something breaks, don't panic. Got it. Me too. <laughs> I'm telling myself that too. <laughs> Almost there. Okay. Up, 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 up. Yeah, that's the position. Teamwork. It's party time, and the client has arrived to see for herself what Gabriella has conjured up. Wow. Oh my God. I know I asked for a spring-themed sculpture. I didn't dream that we'd have something like that. That is absolutely spectacular. It looks like wood. I mean, everyone coming to my event tonight is going to look at that with a massive wow. When we tell them it's chocolate, they're not going to believe it. They're not going to believe it. Beautiful. Beautiful. So now I just need to try and shape it. I do think he comes in here a little more. It'll greet tens of thousands of visitors to the Cake and Bake Show at London's XL Centre. A life-size chocolate figure of... Boris Johnson. I want to make it nice for people to see, but also to show them what can be done out of chocolate. Rosie's sculpture will recreate the moment the then Mayor of London got stuck on a zip wire during the 2012 Olympics. It's going to be a challenge. She'll be sculpting Boris's face, hair, helmet and all of his clothes out of chocolate. I've got to make a life-size figure and I've got to make him look like he's floating in the air. And this is going to weigh a lot. Rosie's already created the bulk of Boris's body from layers of chocolate cake stuck together with chocolate frosting. She's coating it in ganache, a decadent blend of chocolate and cream, a whopping 10 kilos of it. The idea is that you put a layer of ganache on, and it won't be perfect, but if you let it set and dry, then the next time you come along, you fill in the gaps. <laughs> 
and so it gets smoother each time. For the detail, Rosie turns to modelling chocolate, a mixture of three parts chocolate to one part corn syrup. This is actually the flare of his jacket that I'm creating. So this is going to be the bit where his jacket hangs over his trousers. As Boris's body dries, Rosie makes strides with his dangling legs. This is mostly modelling chocolate with a little bit of fondant. And the little bit of fondant means that it will dry and set a little bit more uniformly. But the chocolate gives you the ability to smooth it much, much better. And it smells great. The structure's coming along, but it's the face and the clothes that will make Boris. So Rosie has a lot of work ahead of her. At the moment, my chocolate Boris doesn't look anything like him. He still hasn't got a head. And then I've still got every detail to do. We'll be back later to see if Rosie can manage to turn this into a chocolate replica of this. In Lancashire, chocolatier Rosie Dummer has been working hard on one of the biggest names in politics. She's built Boris's head from chocolate cake covered in chocolate ganache. His features are being moulded from solid chocolate. I'm just trying to get the right shape on his face. Rosie's using modelling chocolate with added fondant to protect Boris's face from temperature fluctuations. I don't want him to melt. Oh, gosh, that would be so awful. Dealing with such a well-known figure means the pressure is really on to get that face right. I think doing heads and doing faces is difficult for a sculptor. It's difficult for professionals who do this all the time. So for me, it's really, really difficult and taking me out of my comfort zone. Just want him to be recognisable. I just want people to say instantly, <laughs> that's Boris. Using a specialist instrument called a Dresden and veining tool, Rosie gets to work on those lugubrious features. He looks better when he's frowning a little bit. So I'm pulling his eyebrows in. Not that he seems to have any eyebrows. I don't think he's got any eyebrows. You know, I'm not being funny. I really can't find them. Let's hope she finds them soon. I've got less than three days. That's not long. They say a week's a long time in politics, don't they? Well, three days is not enough time in cake making. No way. <laughs> Two days later, Rosie's dressed Boris in chocolate clothes and finished his face with edible paint. But there are plenty more details to work on. I've got to put his eyes in. I'm finishing his shoes and his socks, his hands, collars, his cuffs. For Rosie, it's all in the detail. This is the bit I lost. This is going to make all the difference, and it's just a little stitching tool. How cool is that? Tell me that's not cool. Stitching complete, she uses the end of a paintbrush to create lace holes and adds realistic creases for that well-worn look. Next, laces. I might give the laces a bit of texture. So I've got a bit of garlic mesh to give a little bit of an imprint. Oh, I quite like that. I feel that it's coming together now. If I didn't have a deadline, I would be loving this. Mustn't forget the Boris Buffon. So I'm just trying to get it a little bit scruffy. I'm hoping this will transform him into Boris. There's this tuft that's coming out on the actual pictures. He was definitely having a bad hair day. By tomorrow afternoon, chocolate Boris will have to be complete and suspended in all his glory in London's Excel Centre. The centrepiece of the Cake and Bake Show. A five-hour drive away. It looks like I'm getting there. However, I've got to do lots and lots of little bits and pieces. His arms are still not there. And it will take me hours and hours to get to the point that I'm happy. The real magic act is yet to come. Making Boris fly. So we need him to be in the final position so it looks like he's flying. So we want the T-bar fits in there. With Boris's backbone screwed into place... A little bit that way, away, yeah? yeah? Done, you're in. The two halves slot together perfectly. Yes! I'm serious, play some music. Time for the crowning glory. Oh, gosh, it's heavy. A helmet also made from chocolate cake, covered in ganache and chocolate. Boris, you beauty. 
finally, Boris's stand is hidden, giving the illusion he's hanging in midair. Rosie's chocolate Boris is ready. What will people make of him? I think it's amazing. He's very, very now for the current uh, time. I don't really like him, but I like the 100% chocolate cake. Oh, really? The whole thing is made of chocolate? Wow, that's a lot of chocolate in there. I've no idea how she's got it hanging like she has. It's just perfect, isn't it? It's absolutely fantastic. I've got no idea how she's done that. This is exactly the showstopper that I wanted, and the reaction has been better than I expected, so there's no complaints here. With Rosie's creation winning the popular vote, there's only one thing left to do. Is he tasty? I can't believe how good that tastes. <laughs>...this chocolatey wonderland as the workshop of Flo Broughton and her dad, Kerr Dunlop. The pair have agreed to create a vast harvest festival display for charity... ...made from 100 kilos of liquid chocolate. They'll be creating over 150 items. From chocolate asparagus to chocolate croissant... ...with even the plates and cutlery made from chocolate. And if this wasn't enough, they're going to display the feast on a table also made out of chocolate. This is like probably the most different kind of commission that we've ever been asked to do. But actually, I'm really excited to do it because, well, if we can do it, then that means we can do anything, Dad. <laughs> because she promises us stupid things, um, we actually have to do it. How on earth are you going to do it? This Harvest Festival thing. How are we going to do that? Luckily, they have a team of 16 employees hard at work in their mini factory. And with no time to waste, Flo gets cracking on a key element in the display, a pumpkin. So I'm just mixing up some white chocolate with some orange colouring so that I can start to make my centrepiece. She fills her pumpkin mould with the coloured chocolate and coats it evenly. So we've got a nice coating now. After the orange layer sets, she pours in a layer of milk chocolate. This chocolate layering technique is a closely guarded family secret, and they own a patent for it. These trademarked layers of chocolate upon chocolate gave birth to their company name, Choc on Choc. Wow. OK, I'm really pleased with that. Next, Flo wants something to stick her pumpkin on, a chocolate urn. I'm starting to fill this up now to the, towards the top. It's going to be a nice, solid urn. A little leakage, but that's OK. Uh, the joys of playing with chocolate, oh dear. We've never really made anything like this before. Uh, this is definitely a big learning. <laughs> While Flo deals with her leak, the rest of the team are hard at work making chocolate plates and cutlery. And no harvest is complete without fruit and veg. From strawberries to Brussels sprouts, they're making it all. Next on the line, carrots. Can you make sure it's like quite a dark orange so it's like nice and fresh? And can I get 30 more? First, white chocolate mixed with green colouring is piped into the top of the carrot moulds. Then there's more of that layering expertise as orange coloured white chocolate is poured on top. Once the carrots are done, it's time for Flo to crack the urn out of the mould. Not feeling too confident on this one. <laughs> However, I might be pleasantly surprised. This bit. It's pretty tough because this mould is very hard. So I'm just going to snap this out. So we've got a base, that's okay. Got a middle, that's okay. Because I can glue this all back together. It's a bit like fixing broken china. With chocolatey repairs underway, Flo has plenty left to do before the charity event. And there's still the small matter of a table made from chocolate. Back in Somerset, Flo is working on her most ambitious commission to date. Her local pub, The Cross Keys, has asked her to make a harvest festival feast entirely from chocolate. And she's delivered in spades, 
Even the chinaware is edible, and it makes for a sumptuous display. Everything's starting to come together. This is still very much a sort of trial as to how it's going to look. A few of these new items are experiments. So we've never made these before, so it's our first ever chocolate teacup. These are our chocolate biscuits, but they are like water crackers. And then inside this camembert here, if you cut that open, there's white chocolate inside there and it will ooze. But whilst they've already produced an impressive 50 kilos of Harvest Festival goodies, their biggest challenge lies ahead. Making the table the feast will be displayed on out of chocolate. Getting a little bit nervous now because the deadline is looming and we've got quite a lot to do. And a big focus is about to be the table. To support their mammoth feast, the table is going to need strong legs to stand on. But four legs of solid chocolate won't be enough. And it's Flo's dad, Kerr, that has the solution. I thought we could actually pour the chocolate in and then I put that on there and that would actually fix to the chocolate. Here it goes. So I'm going to place this in. So we're hoping then it will bond now nicely together. I think this is going to be a good solution. It does annoy me that Dad's always right. But... <laughs> A couple of hours later, and it's time to see if it's worked. It's a moment of truth. OK. Yeah, it works. Success. Kerr attaches the reinforced chocolate legs to the table, which Flo's team covers okay. with a tablecloth. So we're using a real tablecloth to create the real folds, and then this will get removed, and that will leave us with just the chocolate version of this. We've got seven hours left till the event. <laughs> For the next hour and a half, they use their patented choc and choc layering know-how to create a beautiful white chocolate tablecloth, weighing in at around 40 kilograms. The top is pretty secure now. I think it's just the sides. We're just making sure we've got these bits molded in. But we're also using chocolate that's slightly thicker now, which is much better for the moulding. By using chocolate that has started to set, the team are able to give a more realistic shape to the folds in the tablecloth. We've done between five and six layers on it, so we're feeling OK about this. We're going to let this dry, and then we're going to need to start moving this over to the cross keys so that we can build the feast on the table. But with 50 kilos of festival feast, and 40 kilos of chocolate table, getting it to the pub will be easier said than done. In Somerset, Flo and her team have made a huge harvest festival feast entirely from chocolate. It will be the centerpiece at a charity event at the local pub. And if that wasn't enough, they've also made a white chocolate tablecloth to go over the table. It's coming along all right. I'm hopeful that it will work. <laughs> this is the table and we've got uh, five and a half hours to go. With the chocolate table set, they can now think about setting the table. But they've got to get it to the local pub first. I'm just cutting the seam line so it'll come apart easily. Yeah. Oh, it's heavy. Flo's decided to break the tablecloth into four pieces to make it easier to move. Right. Great. First one done. Just three to go. OK, we're going to... Oh, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. It's all right. Got it. With each quarter weighing around 10 kilos, the tablecloth has cracked under its own weight. It's fine. I'm just snuggling together. Go down. Right. You, Hayley, you got the front? The back of the table is missing. It's not the end of the world. And I'm positive we can still create this whole table. Yeah. Yeah. And Flo's positivity pays off as the front two sections of the table arrive safe and sound. Yep, it's on. The hard bit is finally over. Flo can now decorate her impressive table with her festival feast before the guests arrive. So I'm now doing like the final touches where I'm going to bring the feast to life. Oh, almost. 
from chocolate acorns and leaves to oozing camembert, it's hard to believe that all of this is chocolate. The charity event is finally underway, and it's time for the big chocolatey reveal. Thank you so much for coming to our Chocolate Harvest Festival. We're just so pleased that we've actually managed to achieve this. One, two, three. What a spread. Almost 100 kilos of unbelievable chocolate creations. From a selection of chocolate veg to sandwiches and donuts, with Flo's pumpkin taking centre stage. Not forgetting that chocolate tablecloth. They've thought of everything, including lobsters. And what will the guests eat from? We have chocolate plates, so you're welcome to help yourself to a bit of chocolate. I'm just so pleased. I've lived in the village my whole life, so to be able to produce something as fun as this and the fact everybody is so impressed and loves it just makes it so much better. It is so amazing. It's chocolate. We love chocolate. <laughs> After a long day working in his pub kitchen, Yorkshireman Ashley McCarthy likes to relax with a bit more time in the kitchen. What I do like to do in my spare time is play with this wonderful stuff, which is chocolate. His chocolate creations have included a miniature kitchen, the Mad Hatter's Tea Party and a mini circus. All have one thing in common, their diminutive size. But that's about to change. I've been commissioned to do uh, a really massive piece. It's actually a nearly life-size Elvis Presley. It's something I've never done before, totally out of my comfort zone. The sculpture will be the star attraction at a surprise party for an Elvis impersonator friend and will gobble up a hefty 60 kilograms of chocolate. I'm just doing some white chocolate drops uh, in a food processor just to warm them up slightly. Uh, just to make like a white chocolate clay. So all that's going to be is like a plasticine, but an edible plasticine. Quite satisfying, actually. The white chocolate will cover the body Ashley's already made. This, believe it or not, will be, or is, the king of rock and roll. This is Elvis Presley in chocolate. It scares me to death. It's giving me nightmares already, and it's really... I don't know what, how it's going to turn out. Standing four foot tall, Elvis will weigh the same as a real man when he's finished. We've got a coating of, of milk chocolate. Underneath that, we've got Rice Krispies and, and marshmallow just to sort of form the bulk, just to take a bit of the weight out of it, really. And then we've got a wooden frame. But Ashley's lack of experience with large sculptures could prove to be the king's undoing. Early, I just knocked the arm and we've got a massive crack on there, so I've got to be really careful. Hence why I've got him trussed up a bit like a chicken. The last thing I want him to do is his nose dive onto the floor, even though there's no nose just yet. Next, Ashley paints a thin layer of white chocolate to cover the brown milk chocolate and to provide a base for the surface layer. We're using white chocolate purely because this is the Elvis in Vegas look. So we need his, his white jumpsuit. But there's one problem that threatens to ruin Elvis's comeback. Summer temperatures more suited to Las Vegas than North Yorkshire. The thing is, it's so hot at the moment, we're just going through a, an unusual heat wave for, for British summertime. And the, the chocolate's just not drying, so he's going to stay in the kitchen overnight, keep nice and cool. Elvis won't be leaving the building tonight. in Yorkshire, chef and chocolate sculptor Ashley McCarthy is bringing an American rock and roll legend back to life. He's working on his biggest ever chocolate creation, a near life-sized Elvis Presley. It's a gift for Elvis impersonator Tim, a close friend who has faced a long battle with cancer. Tim's been a good friend of mine for many, many years. He's had a really tough year uh, this year, being diagnosed with cancer for the third time. Uh, and this time it's, 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 it's not good. The pressure's on just to, to impress Tim, because uh, that's what we're all here to do, and we're all here to put a smile on his face. To put that smile on Tim's face, 
Ashley needs to get down to business and give the king of rock and roll a chocolate head. We're going to start working on his face and obviously the, the Elvis hair needs to be done as well. So uh, quite a challenge today to get all the, the fine detail done. To replicate Elvis's skin tone, Ashley mixes some coloured cocoa butter into the white chocolate. Out of the whole piece, really, the face is the biggest challenge to do. You must have one of the, if not the most famous face in the world. The chocolate contains lots of glucose, making it shiny and easy to mould. It does feel a bit like being a plastic surgeon, does this? What have I done? Ashley's Elvis is intended to be more caricature than exact replica, but the King's trademark sneering lips are threatening to take over. I'm just struggling here to get the actual positioning. It's really fiddly to get the detail on how I want it. And I certainly don't want it to look like the Ronaldo statue. Perhaps Ashley will have better luck with the King's distinctive back-combed hair and thick sideburns, recreated with fine-combed dark chocolate. It's coming together quite well. But Elvis wouldn't be Las Vegas Elvis without his regal belt, finished here with an edible glaze and glitter. I'm writing his name on just in case it doesn't look uh, too much like Elvis, so then when people see his belt buckle, it'll give it away a bit. The only way to get chocolate to stick to chocolate is by using chocolate. Just a few finishing notes now to make this epic chocolate sculpture sing. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Happy how that's come out. But now Ashley's got to transport Elvis along 40 minutes of bumpy road without the king missing a note or a lip. He has no idea that he's about to meet the chocolate king of rock and roll. He's been diagnosed with terminal cancer, and his family and friends have gathered to celebrate his 40th birthday. Tim is about to enter the building. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim Milton. What will Tim, whose Elvis impersonations have been much loved locally, make of his chocolate alter ego? Are you mad? <laughs> <laughs> that is just so, that's something else, is that? <laughs> oh, man alive. He just can't help falling in love with Ashley's biggest ever chocolate creation. The unveiling of that, I'm absolutely blown away. I love you, man. Thank you so much. You're amazing. I've had it in my back room in storage for quite some time. I just couldn't bear to part with it. This is a 1927 flat tank AJS, recreated in chocolate. Now Prudence has agreed to soup it up with killer details for the Motorcycle Museum's birthday in six days. She intends to make everything from chocolate mudguards to a chocolate petrol tank, all good enough to eat. Up first, some chocolatey suspension. To do this sort of wrapped around coil, I've got some dark chocolate paste, which is dark chocolate mixed with some glucose and water. And it's what I like to call bendy chocolate. It's really good fun. <laughs> I've got another five of these to make, and they're all slightly different sizes, and some nuts and bolts as well. No detail is too small to satisfy the bike experts who will see it at the museum. Each nut is a slightly different size. They've got to be precise and they have to look real. As if she isn't busy enough working on the details of the actual bike, 
her perfectionist spirit is reaching new levels of geekiness. She's making an oil spill that actually reflects light. I've had a go at trying to get the light that you get in a CD, because to me that looks like the colours that you see on an oil spill on the road. And I wanted to find as a way of getting that onto the chocolate. Prue has peeled off the top holographic layer of the CD and covered it in chocolate. Miraculously, the rainbow-coloured light has transferred into the chocolate. I have no idea how it's happened, but it is in there. It's just baffling. It looks like a CD. Not quite an oil spill yet. It's got to be correct, otherwise I'm going to look like a bit of an idiot. The sheen on the oil spill isn't the only one Prudence is creating. She sprays cocoa butter all over the chocolatey metalwork so that every last detail looks good enough to eat. The handlebars have had a bit of a makeover. This is nice, nice and edible. So people could go up to this and literally like that, which I think would be really fun. She's made a vintage tax disc using a lollipop mould and added new cabling. She's even figured out a way to shape her oil stain. See that it's really, really wavy. They're quite fragile, though, so I don't even want to pick it up. To make sure everyone gets it, Prudence has made a chocolate oil can. I've added some edible colours and a label that even says on here it's for chocolate motorcycles. Yeah, I kind of like it. And the fact that you can just smash it open and eat it is brilliant as well. And in a final effort to win over the bike fans, she's come up with a special treat. I thought it'd be quite nice to make some chocolate spanners to hand out to people. My dad, who's helping me on this project, has made a fantastic spanner mould using one of his old spanners. They can actually eat these. It's going to be quite fun, isn't it? Quite a bit of chocolate to bite into as well. Once dusted in edible silver, they'll totally look the part. And as a finishing touch, she also has an idea that she wants to test on her father. Hiya, Hello. Daddy. How's it going, then? Well, I've got a little surprise for you. Oh, crikey. Go yeah. on, then. <sighs> no? What is that? It's an engine starting. It's a doorbell. <laughs> the anniversary at the Motorcycle Museum is tomorrow. We'll soon see if the chocolate 1927 AJS has what it takes to impress the bike's superfans. Now there's one last thing to do. Get on to the hideous task of how are we going to pack it and move it, which is making me feel a bit sick. <laughs> Turns out, cling film is the way forward. Probably not actually going to do anything at all, but it's making me feel a bit happier that there's at least some sort of protection on it. Just shout if you're worried about anything. It was really, really, really stressful. So it's just got to get them out in one piece and hope that nothing goes <coughs> in uh, transit. OK, I'm just going to hold my breath the entire journey. Oh, God, are we nearly there yet? Luckily, it made it in one piece. In the last six days, Prudence has restored everything from the petrol tank to the wheels and every nut and bolt in between, all in lovely edible chocolate. But will the motorbike superfans give their seal of approval? As she thought from a distance, it was a real bike. And then when I got closer, I noticed it was chocolate and I just drawn to it. Love chocolate. It looks like the real thing. Like I definitely eat it. it. It would probably take me a, a month, if that. I mean, the shine on the seat and on the mud guard, it's absolutely brilliant. And the fact it's made out of chocolate is better. Would you like a chocolate spanner? Would you like a chocolate spanner? Oh, you sure? chocolate spanner. Yeah. Success. 
Even motorcycling champion Steve Plater made chocolate. is impressed. These spanners are actually edible, mate. Yeah, why? <laughs> why, mate? You can't do that, can you? Yeah, chocolate spanner, dude. Are you enjoying it? <laughs> what a great, what a great piece of kit. Never seen one before made never, out of chocolate. Never. Oh, what do you think? Brilliant. Really, you know, attention to detail is fabulous. You've won TT, Steve. Could you, could you win on it? Well, I tell you what. <laughs> You wouldn't want to get it overheated, would you? <laughs> <laughs> this is where legends live on in the motorcycle world. So to have this here with all these other classics has just completed my dream. It is the wonderful world of chocolate. The world's largest Easter egg, built in Argentina in 2012 to a towering eight metres high. Then, rather less of a climb, the world's largest chocolate bar, just one metre high but six metres long and weighing six tonnes. American, of course. And now the ever-rising tide of chocolate excess has thrown up yet another new chocolate-soaked world record. My name is uh, Helmut Wenschitz. Welcome to my chocolate world, home of the highest chocolate fountain in the world. He's right. Hold on tight. This is the highest chocolate fountain in the whole wide chocolatey world. It's a cocoa guzzling 12.3 meters high and contains one and a half tons of dark chocolate worth 6,000 pounds. Inside is a dark chocolate with 60% of cocoa. Helmut designed the record-breaking fountain to lure visitors to his chocolate world, here in Elharming, Austria. A showcase for the history, production, and appreciation of chocolate spread over a thousand square meters and three grand floors. I need an idea, I need an, a wow effect for my uh, chocolate uh, world and uh, so uh, the idea was coming uh, to, to build a high chocolate uh, fountain. It was 2,000 hours to build. The, when the kids come inside, you say, wow, what a chocolate fountain, yeah. Helmut's inspiration came from the world's previous tallest chocolate fountain at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. But that was only eight meters tall and wasn't even pure chocolate, containing vegetable oil and coloring. And in my chocolate fountain is real chocolate, yeah, and you smell them. To keep it flowing smoothly from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day, Helmut has to maintain the chocolate at a constant temperature of 21 degrees. That's also a comfortable temperature for his visitors. But the maintenance doesn't end there. Every week, the fountain has to be cleaned. It's a chocolatey, perilous job that Helmut does himself. I climb on the chocolate fountain. This is very high, yeah. And uh, I personally clean the chocolate fountain. I need spectral shapers, and then uh, I take the chocolate in the middle of the plates. Luckily, this chocoholic doesn't suffer from vertigo. Don't look down, <laughs> then it's easy. <laughs> now here's the bad news. With the chocolate flowing here day in and day out for up to two years, you probably wouldn't want to eat any. I think I'm in the chocolate heaven. Perugia in central Italy could claim to be the most chocolatey town in Europe. Home not just to the Nestle factory, but to this, Euro chocolate, the biggest chocolate festival in the world. Covering 10,000 square meters, one million chocoholics will descend here over 10 days. As well as the big brands like Lindt and Italy's Baci, you can find more niche delicacies like chocolate pasta. And chocolate liqueurs, served in chocolate glasses, of course. Good. One of the highlights of the festival is the chocolate sculpting event. 
local artists have a single day to turn these one metre square blocks of chocolate into show-stopping artworks. But these aren't trained chocolatiers. First is safety-conscious Francesco, shop owner and graphic designer. Today he's working with his niece Chiara. No helmet for her. Second is Stefano, university professor and painter. He's also a free spirit who likes a challenge. I am ready! Third is Paolo, a sculptor in his own right, and his laid-back team. And last is Massimo, also a sculptor. We're told he's the most famous of them all. And they're off! The enthusiastic sculpting pulls an eager crowd, hoping to catch some of the chips that fall off the chocolate blocks. Some people do better than others. This piece is uh, very heavy, heavy. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, very good. Enjoying the show is local hotel owner Valeria Guaducci. All these pieces may well end up in her chocolate collection. I like looking for sculptures every year because I have the possibility of choose the sculptures and to take them in my hotel. So this is a privilege for me. Why does Valeria get to keep the chocolate sculptures? What's left of them? In this chocolate-mad town, she has a very unusual hotel. Welcome to Etruscan Choc Hotel. Follow me. This hotel is uh, an amazing place where chocolate is all over. As you see, we have uh, chocolate art everywhere. Including sculptures from last year's festival. One is these. And this is another. This is the third sculpture. You see a beautiful horse and all is chocolate. But will this year's measure up? Back at Euro Chocolate, Paolo, the sculptor, is the first to finish his creation, a giant phone. Simple maybe, but recognizable. Not all the sculptures are. I know that's a chocolate. It's a big chocolate. It's hard to tell by now. <laughs> I think it's sculpturing. Uh, well, yeah. As for graphic designer Francesco and his niece Chiara, they are not quite done, although it's seven hours into the challenge. It's first time for me working with chocolate. It's tiring, but I like chocolate very much. <laughs> but Chiara and Francesco are not the last to finish. As the light fades, university professor Stefano and friends are still tapping away. And they're fast running out of time as Valeria's back to choose the sculptures that will live on inside her hotel. First up for inspection, Francesco and Chiara's artwork. I think it's very beautiful. It's a big bottom, and it is inspired by the main fountain. So uh, I like it. Pat on the back for Francesco and Chiara. But what will Valeria make of Paolo's phone? I, I don't know if uh, I'll choose this. Oh dear. Massimo's sculpture goes down better. Also this one is very beautiful and original. And abstract. Stefano is still not finished. Will his extra effort be worth it? This sculpture is a masterpiece. That's a yes, then. It's the griffin that is a symbol of uh, the town. So the match is fantastic for me. The best sculpture, I think. Valeria decides she'll take all of the sculptures back to her hotel, except the phone. And 11 hours after he started, Stefano is finally finished. Welcome to Barra Valleys. 
Mark and Emma have already handmade every chocolatey item on sale here. And now, they've just taken on their biggest commission to date. So I have this huge challenge of making a chocolate Father Christmas for Cardiff Castle for their Christmas event. And they'd like it life-size. This massive chocolate Santa must be delivered to Cardiff Castle in just five days' time. Chocolatier Emma will need to devote every working hour to meet the deadline. So why does she seem to be preparing for Easter? I make a lot of eggs. This is the largest mould that I have. It's just a way of creating a big shape without getting too much weight. And an egg is a really strong shape in nature, so it's a good form to work with. Making Santa's skeleton out of giant Easter eggs has another benefit too. They're perfect for the big man's trademark belly. So I'm just gonna tilt it. I think I'm gonna use the fattest part as his tummy um, and then build out his shoulders. I'm gonna quickly start building up his head in proportion. Emma uses a grater to carefully shape Santa's shoulder to fit onto his body. So I'm building um, the shoulders in place now, and then I'm going to start building it up, and that's when it'll start to look, hopefully, like Father Christmas. The best glue for sticking chocolate to chocolate is chocolate itself. So all Emma has to do is melt the base of Santa's head on the hot plate to make it sticky. He's starting to take shape, but not as we know it. Santa's still got some way to come before he's ready to meet the kids at Cardiff Castle. Back in North Wales, Emma is still some way from making her chocolate Santa lifelike. And the event in Cardiff Castle is in just three days. We unpacked it. It's huge. I know. Husband Mark has asked Santa's helpers to send over a sleigh, which in this day and age is, of course, self-assembly. Incredibly detailed instructions. <laughs> well, that'll keep you busy this afternoon, won't it? Yeah, no problem at all, yeah. Build a sleigh, run a shop, <laughs> sell chocolate. <laughs> Open a chocolate shop, they said. <laughs> It'll be easy, they It'll said. Be It'll be fun. <laughs> Emma, meanwhile, has the small matter of sculpting this Mr. Blobby look-alike into a realistic Father Christmas. I'm using my, um, I think they're Chinese carving tools. I love these, they're woodworking, really, I think. I use these a lot and get all the, the folds of the fabric in place. As we all know, the secret of a really convincing Santa is his beard. So I'm just creating uh, the beard by swirling the over-tempered chocolate, which is really thick, but it's really good because it, al it almost sculpts straight away without being too fluid, and you can make lovely patterns in it. Nose and eyes come next, and just like that, Santa starts to come to life. My great uncle was a portrait painter, and he taught me a lot about anatomy, understanding the, the skeleton underneath and how things are built up with muscles, and it's definitely paying off. And now Emma is ready to paint on that famous red jacket. I'm just creating a bit of texture so it looks almost like a woven cloth and then that'll be a nice contrast to the, the shiny bits. I'm mixing my colour now. It's cocoa-based colours. It paints nicely onto the chocolate. It's all edible and it's all natural. Chocolate, to me, is all about using all of the senses, so the visual aspect is so important before you even taste. It's vital that something looks appealing. This is where Emma's choice of white chocolate pays off. It really shows the vibrancy of the colour, more so than if I was to paint on dark chocolate. And I'm going to exaggerate the tones with the jacket by putting a darker, like, shadows in, you know, in between the folds. So just hopefully bring it all to life. Are we getting on? Getting the red on. 
husband and business partner Mark has finished assembling the sleigh. His next job will be to transport this work of chocolate art across country. So I was thinking, um, instead of him going in the van, now that we've got his sledge, couldn't we get his reindeer to come and take him to Cardiff? <laughs> Shall we have a look? Yeah. I'm really nervous. Santa has made it, and he looks stunning. White chocolate beard, hugely expressive eyes, round rosy cheeks, and a solid chocolate hat. Like a painting in 3D. He does look fantastic, though. You've done a cracking job, you know. Wrinkles and everything. Yeah. Did you model him off me? His laugh lines, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> the Baravellis are happy, but will Cardiff's kids and their parents believe in this chocolate Santa? Real chocolate. Yeah. I love it so much. You and love it so much. It. Yes. it looks very, very tasty. May I have a bite? <laughs> <laughs> Which part of Santa would you eat first then? I think the hat. I think, yeah, the hat looks really good. Just work our way down, is it? Yeah. <laughs> We came here to see the real Santa, but we weren't expecting to see a life-size chocolate Santa. On display till Christmas, Santa's not for eating just yet. So Emma's made chocolate bars and baubles to munch on. How's the chocolate? Is it nice and creamy? Yeah. yeah. But the star remains Santa, made in just five days. I think it is the biggest item I've ever made in probably the shortest space of time. Christmas is only once a year, which is a good job. <laughs> But the last word has to go to the man himself, who sneaked in to have a peek before heading off on his rounds. I'm rather flattered, you know. I, I, I think you look rather wonderful. I did a double take. Once they realise that it's not actually me, they are probably going to want to eat him. <laughs> Delicious. Well, a Merry Christmas, everybody, and be sure to eat lots and lots of chocolate confections. <laughs> Bye, Santa. Bye-bye now. Bye.